you're writing something, you start to feel like you're airing dirty laundry and it's like, oh God, I don't think I want anyone to see this, this side of myself, it's probably a sign that it's worth doing. I do think you can make any movie personal if you find a way in. You could make a movie about the Middle Ages or about, you know, uh, outer space or what have you um, and make it personal. So part of the intent with Whiplash was, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write something small and focused and lean and mean and 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 really sort of simple. It doesn't matter if you hear a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand no's, all you need is one yes. If you're telling a story about love, love it has to be bigger than the characters actually. It has to be this kind of, this third character or this thing that kind of lives on and, and it can't just depend on the practicalities of whether the people are in the same place at the same time at the end. La La Land was all about, on an emotional level, it was all about stuff that I had felt or that I had lived through or that I had experienced. That I think is the best way to work, no matter what genre you're working in, to try to find what's personal in it. I think actually it has a lot to do with actually how I sort of initially conceived the movie. I'd been trying to write stuff for a while that was kind of a little more unwieldy and bigger and a little more sort of sprawling and hadn't really gotten anywhere. I'd had a few sort of dead ends of scripts I'd poured a lot of passion into and then wound up just kind of like not very good. You know, they're not only unmakeable, but literally like my intention wasn't really translating. So part of the intent with Whiplash was, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write something small and focused and lean and mean and, and, and really sort of simple in a way, like hopefully not simplistic, hopefully you can, you can sort of expand it to, to a bigger canvas of ideas, but the actual story itself I wanted to be incredibly clear cut and about you know, two people with very clearly defined goals who are just going like this. Um, until they realize they have the same goal, basically. But, but so, so it, was, it, it, it was important from that whole kind of thinking that from the very first image of the movie, the very first scene in the movie, that it just be very much what it was, that there'd be no beating around the bush. So it's like the movie was gonna be about a drummer, so you literally open with a guy drumming. And, and the story itself is really about the drummer's relationship with the teacher. So that's what the first scene had to be. It had to introduce the drummer, the teacher, and tell you exactly what that relationship was gonna be. And then the rest of the movie could basically just vary, you know, riff on that, on that, on that theme. But I like the idea of basically having an entire movie within the opening scene of a movie um, and kind of giving the audience the clothesline that then you can sort of elaborate on as it goes on. I think there's a reason why many of the greatest most of the greatest love stories in history don't end with happily ever after. If you're telling a story about love, love it has to be bigger than the characters actually. It has to be this kind of, this third character or this thing that kind of lives on and, and it can't just depend on the practicalities of whether the people are in the same place at the same time at the end. Those stories give you that sense that even if the relationship itself might be over, the love is not over, the love lasts and I think that's just a beautiful kind of thing. Oh, well. Can you just talk it's about your process? And everybody here is a writer, a producer, a director, or all three. A little bit about your process on, on what you, why you chose the, the way to end the film that you did and what your feelings were about the bench scene and what came after. Uh, well, the, <clears throat> the bench scene, I guess, probably came later because uh, I think at the very, uh, at the very start, I knew roughly where we were headed in terms of the final scene. Um, I knew I wanted to tell a story about uh, a romance that doesn't, you know, that doesn't last forever. Something that winds up being a finite moment in these people's lives. And they're kind of like two ships passing in the night. They cross for a moment and that moment is crucial for both of them. Um, but they wind up going their separate directions. Um, and I wanted, I knew I wanted the tone of the ending to be okay with that. You know, that I didn't really see it as a, as a tragic ending. Um, uh, I mean, I was certainly very inspired by uh, the Umbrellas of Cherbourg, the French, French musical from the 60s, and, and that, that uh, uh, similarly does not keep the romance going at the end. Um, but, but where's the tone there? I think is a little more, again, tragic. I think here, here I wanted to, uh, I wanted there be, I wanted there to be a real hope uh, to the ending, and, and and also this idea that you know some dreams come true, some don't. This wouldn't be an honest movie if every dream in it came true. It wouldn't be an honest movie if every dream didn't. But it's a movie about dreamers. It's a movie about the dreams that kind of push us and guide us. Um, so uh, um, so it was important to me that you know some things work out, some don't. That 
you know, uh, that Mia becomes the actress she wanted to become, that, that in many ways Sebastian um, becomes a version of himself that he wanted to become, but sacrifices come with that. So I guess I saw it as still a positive ending, but just one that maybe would be a little, a little less predictable. And do you think that's something that you'll seek to do throughout the rest of your career? Have that kind of personal edge in each project you do? I mean, or could you see yourself one day, say, doing like a, a big Marvel superhero movie? Or do you, do you always need to have that more intimate personal react, uh, connection, I guess, to the material? I, I would always need to have some intimate personal connection to the material, but that doesn't mean that it has to be a literal connection, you know? So I do think you can make any movie personal if you find a way in. You could make a movie about the Middle Ages or about, you know, uh, outer space or what have you um, and make it personal even if you know again those things are very far removed from you so I, I I guess I'll always be no matter what the genre is trying to find that kind of that kind of deep-seated connection where where at the end of the day I'm writing or filming about my own emotions my own experiences whether literally or not I like to get notes that are specific and 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 where the person giving the notes uh, can kind of stand behind the notes, um, which a lot of times when you get into the studio, in the more kind of studio world, um, that kind of goes out the window, and 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 you get these sort of uh, the we notes. You get yeah the we notes that are like ten page manuals that have like begin with an abstract, uh, and then kind of go into. Uh, the most overwritten, and when you really kind of parse them, mean absolutely nothing notes you've ever you've ever read. Uh, you know, like a packet of notes that are longer than the script, but are you know kind of, and and then we'll basically say, you know, you need to add this and elaborate on this, and this doesn't, and we really think you should do this, and we really think this, and then of course they always end with, oh, and once you've added all these things, the script also needs to be half as long, and <laughs> and it's and and. Uh, uh, and it's not necessarily that kind of. Again, a lot of times those things are right. It's it's the it's the um, it's also the kind of uh, the not again the not standing behind the notes. Like one, I forget if it was uh, 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 if it was John Stewart or or Stephen Colbert or someone years ago had a great uh, uh, one of them had a great bit about. Uh, in the media, how uh, media outlets would get away with saying really outrageous things by phrasing it as a question, you know? <laughs> so it'd be like, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, are, are dogs secret psychopaths, question mark. And, like, and then it'll be like an article that's like, I guess sort of a kind of somewhat sensible article about like one dog where they found some gene or something that kind of, you know, but but they try to do clickbait things and they sort of uh, uh, and they have this headline, but they don't have the balls to actually just say the headline as a declarative statement. You know, your dog is a secret psychopath who's going to kill you. <laughs> they have to do it as a question mark, and that to me is studio notes a lot. Is it's that they 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 won't stand behind. They won't actually tell you your character needs to be more likable. Uh, you you need to have a happy ending, and uh, and um, you know. Uh, uh, and there needs to be a, a whatever, yeah. And you need to, uh, and, and there needs to be a message. It's always like, you know, should the character be more likable? Question mark. Let's discuss. <laughs> it's like, no. I know what you want. Just say it. I'm curious about the uh, lead up to get the green light, the official green light to get going. You said you had made a short, and you started to send that around mm -hmm. on IMDb. There's like 14 producers on on your IMDb page. Was there like a particular producer when they came on it was like here you go like when was that moment what was that moment where you like okay now we're going it was sort of like a step-by-step -step process I mean uh, the first people to come on the first person at all to come on weirdly enough was was Blumhouse uh, uh, who sort of normally do paranormal activity and normally do horror movies and um, which I guess is not weirdly enough given, <laughs> given how Dana responded but it, um, Initially, a guy who I knew there read it and, and liked the script, didn't really see how it would fit into their model, but knew Jason Reitman's producer. So sent it to Jason Reitman's producer, and then Jason Blum and Jason Reitman wound up kind of, with their producers, Helen Esberg and Cooper Samuelson, wound up becoming the producing unit. Um, and I remember when that first happened, I thought, oh, this is great. I've got these sort of powerhouse you know, production companies. This is great. I'm, I'm going to, you know, we'll, we'll easily get the money. 
And but that also was not was not enough. It was it was after that that we then sort of decided, okay, let's let's try something else. Let's try also doing this short film. Um, and and we did the short film initially just as a thing to just show to investors. I didn't think anyone other than investors would see it. But then as we were cutting it, we you know we sort of liked it and we thought, why not submit it to Sundance? And that'll be like a good if it gets into Sundance, that'll be a good platform for it. So we sent it to Sundance and and we played there. And that kind of that was so that would have been January 2013, and a few months later we got the we got the financing for the movie. So it, it because helped because it was the best short at Sundance. Well, thank you, thank you, JK. I'm just saying, JK's in the short, so you can't exactly <laughs> trust what he's saying. But uh, but <laughs> uh, but uh, um, and then it's then it was. Uh, the good thing though was like by the time, so like people talk, when we, we came back the next Sundance with the feature and, and obviously like that's a very quick turnaround but it's a little misleading because the script existed before the short and, and in a way the whole kind of roadmap for the movie had existed before the short. So as soon as, we, the good thing was as soon as we got the financing which would have been in like May or June 2013, we were like immediately ready to go. We immediately um, cast Miles and got into prep and then we're shooting in September. And how did the feature do at Sundance? The feature was the best at Sundance, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every art form needs to change in order to stay relevant and stay, stay urgent. Ideally, you find some happy medium between, between, between honoring the past but pushing it forward. With a movie like this, my hope was to kind of take things that might have seemed dusty or, or like relics, might have seemed outdated tropes from older movies that might have seemed like they didn't apply to today, but try to reinvest them with a certain kind of modern energy and put them in a modern context and subvert them and, and add on to them and just try to extend that tradition. So not just, not just kind of replicate, but try to actually um, try to change them. That's how you keep an art form alive, whether it's jazz or movies or the musical specifically. That's what's important to me, finding that kind of combination of, of you know, taking, learning from the past but pulling it into the future. I, I was lucky to, you know, when I was starting out to have various mentors along the way who I could lean on for advice and for, for insight and sometimes just for encouragement because sometimes that can be the most important thing. You know, you, you, you hear so many uh, so many no's, so many rejections, you know, uh, along the way of trying to get a film made or, or get a story that you want to tell told. Um, and so, you know, in some ways I think the, the best advice I maybe ever heard was, was, which I try to keep, you know, with me to this day, which is, you know, is that it doesn't matter if you hear a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand no's, all you need is one yes. Um, and, uh, and so to try to kind of keep that kind of faith and to keep being persistent and to not be discouraged, to not be um, um, overly sensitive to, to, you know, to those rejections, I think that's really key. You have to develop a sort of thick skin um, uh, and, and kind of soldier on with a belief that, that the story you're trying to tell is worth telling. It doesn't mean to shut yourself off from, from what could be very valid critiques or, or, or feedback from outside sources, but um, but to but to have that kind of strength of will inside to not be discouraged and to not be uh, uh, you know sent back in the other direction. Um, I think uh, uh, in some ways that's the the greatest kind of skill to develop of all, and maybe the most useful. Yeah, I remember reading about um, Scorsese's New York, New York. That it was very uh, it was hard for him to kind of plan out those musical numbers because he was doing it bar by bar in the shot list. I'm wondering if, I mean, the way you choreograph the numbers is so interesting and so great. And I'm wondering if, did you take a similar approach where you had like caravan bar by bar, shot by shot? Uh, yeah, actually, I mean, yeah, totally. It was, uh, you know, it's helpful again to have the music to start with. It gives you a kind of, as opposed to trying to map out what a car chase is gonna look like, you, in a way, your score has been already figured out. So your, the length and tempo and timing of the scene has been already figured out. So, um, so when I was I storyboarded the whole movie, and I, you know, those sequences, I waited until we had you know, versions of pre-records for those songs, so that I could storyboard to those songs. And um, and so I just drew you know kind of relatively crude images of kind of you know basically an edit plan, a shot list, but, but really sort of as storyboarded as an edit plan, storyboarded as what you would see on screen. And then, and then I just, you know, <laughs> scanned those images, put them into a computer and, and, and uh, cut them up to the music. So, 
So me, the DP, the editor, the, all the crew before we shot could kind of see, could see a hand-drawn version of, of Caravan or of any of the musical numbers. And, um, and, and then from there, the AD and I kind of, you know, and DP kind of figured out, okay, well, how, you know, what order are we going to shoot in? It becomes, that becomes a whole mathematical sort of uh, nightmare. Um, when you have, you know, when you have a stage of 20 musicians, you have, you know, X number of hours, you can be there. Uh, you can only have extras in the audience for six hours, so you, ha you can't, you, you, anything pointing this way has to be done at this time, but there's, that's, that means that you have to jump ahead through all different t times, parts of the number, and then you're going to point this way, and, um, and you have to start this end of the stage first, and then move there, and then move there, so again, you're jumping through, and Miles' makeup level in the end is changing um, throughout, you know, he starts off kind of normal, by the end he's a dripping mess of sweat, and, and, um, and then you have playback, so you're, you, 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 and you have three cameras going at once. So it's, it's having to kind of make sure that the cameras don't get in each other's shots. It just becomes this, this jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together. Um, so we spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, camera A is going to be doing, you know, shot, you know, 137, while camera B does shot, you know, 241, and, you know, this can be on this trombone, and this could be here. And, um, and it's weird because it's, for a while, you feel like you're hardly making art. You feel like you're... Uh, you know, building a, a ship or something, and um, and it's just engineering. And uh, but then you get on 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 set, and you have the the actors and the musicians, and you start doing it, and you hear the music, and it's loud, and it's in the theater, and then suddenly you're looking at things on the monitor, and it's very fragmented, so you have a hard time seeing what the whole number will look like. But at least you kind of get a little bit of the feel of what it's going to be, um, and then you know they carried over into the editing. <coughs> And you did this in 19 days? Uh, yeah, that's been exact. It was 20, 20 days. Because <laughs> we had insert days. So, um, Damien, in your past three films, including First Man, the main characters have all embarked on different journeys, but uh, in the end, they share an intimate moment between each other where nothing is said, and you kind of let the actors um, inhabit the moment, if you will. So I'm just really curious as to what draws you to these intimate conclusions. Um, <laughs> I think, well, I, I turned to, to Claire for a second because uh, I, I, I do think the only reason any of those conclusions work, I, I, if they do work at all, is, is, is because of the actors. And in some cases, for example, First Man, mm -hmm. I, they weren't the original ending. Mm. Um, and, uh, but it was, you know, when we were shooting, I had a sense, and certainly when I did the first uh, cut with... Uh, the editor Tom Cross of, of First Man, what Ryan and Claire just did with that scene, um, which was, you know, as you can expect, you know, two lines in the script, yeah. like very short description. What they did with it just felt so beautiful and complex and fitting. Um, I guess I guess the one thing I do like uh, that I put some sort of pre-thought into is is trying to uh, sounds cheesy, but trying to end. S like a movie with just kind of pure cinema, not yeah. not trying to overstuff the ending with dialogue, but just trying to let um, you've kind of done a lot of your mechanical storytelling to get you to this point, and so ideally by that last stretch you should be able to just let it flow, just let it sing, just let it be what it is, whether yeah, it's a musical yeah. number or or a wordless sequence between two people. So I, that might be part of why I gravitate towards it, but in this movie's case, it really was just being kind of blown away by right right well and I think it's super effective and I do want to ask you about that but it, just out of curiosity what was the original ending to the film well it, it, it was just a little bit afterwards we, we, we spent a little more time in quarantine and then basically it ended with Neil uh, uh, going home okay. and um, and being informed that he wouldn't be able to which you know you sort of you would expect he'd, he would never be allowed to go into space again right hi everybody thank you all for watching if you'd like to see a transcript of this video in a PDF format and 5 extra tips from Damien Chazelle, head over to our Patreon page and consider supporting this channel. You will find the link in the description below. See you all next week.